This is our look at the healthcare marketplace policy changes. Um, this is for permanent open enrollment for subsidies for eligible Vermonters. So Sean, I've got you first. Um, I, is that the way it should go? Are you gonna explain this? That sounds great, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy oh, to do okay. that. Um, Sean, Sean Sheehan, Senior Policy and Implementation Analyst from the Department of Vermont Health Access. Um, thank you all for your for your time. Looking forward to the to the conversation. Okay. Sean, is this a, like an official request from the state? Yeah, this this I think is more. We're more here. Um, I think out of um, you know, I think partnership and and cooperation. This particular okay. this particular rule that will be be discussing when we reached out in the fall, we weren't sure whether it needed to be dealt with in in statute or rule. We've since gotten clarification um, you know, from the feds that it's fine to deal with in the rulemaking process. Um, so okay. we wanted to, uh, you know, to share that with with this this okay. committee. Um, obviously, it's probably best if we understand, because I'm going to get a thing asking me if it complies with legislative intent. <laughs> yeah. so it'd be That's, good to know that. All right. Absolutely. Um, so I think to take a step back, I think most of the committee is is familiar with our health insurance marketplace, Vermont Health Connect, at a at a high level. But just to set the stage, um, open enrollment is the period we're in right now. In past years, it ran through December fifteenth. This year, uh, the feds extended it through January fifteenth, and Vermont followed suit. So it runs through this. This Saturday, and open enrollment is the time that anybody can sign up for health and dental plans through the through the marketplace. Okay, um, this is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, and and the the reason why uh, under the Affordable Care Act they set up a period of open enrollment and not have you know, people be able to sign up any time of year was due to to adverse selection. And I I caught on on Friday's session you were talking about. Adverse election, so mm -hmm. <laughs> good good timing to be all all primed on on that that front. Um, well, the the, I, is, I'm having chest pain, so I think <laughs> I'll go get health insurance scenario. Right. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's the idea that if you're feeling healthy, why spend money on on health insurance? Wait until you get sick and then sign up for for health insurance then. And so, in order to prevent that, is why under the Affordable Care Act they set up open enrollment period, the time of year you. You could sign up, but outside of open enrollment, there are there are going to be times and occasions where people need health insurance, and they're not trying to play games. They're not trying to, um, you know, only get the health insurance when they when they need it. And so we have special enrollment periods. And usually, special enrollment periods have been tied to life events. For example, if you change jobs and your old job offered employer sponsored insurance and your new job doesn't, that would be. A, a life event that would give you 60 days to be able to enroll in a plan through the marketplace. Similarly, if you move into the state of Vermont, um, you obviously wouldn't have had, you move in in April, you obviously wouldn't have had Vermont health insurance you know, during open enrollment time. Um, or if you're on Medicaid and you're found ineligible for, for Medicaid, um, you would likewise have 60 days to, to enroll um, in a, a qualified health plan. Uh, now, what's what's different about this particular special enrollment period is that it wouldn't be tied to a life event per se. It would be tied to to an income income level, um, and the the federal government is is looking at uh, or is for, for this year moving to have a permanent special enrollment period for people whose income is up to 150 percent of the federal poverty level. Um, Medicaid covers you up to 138% of the federal poverty level in most cases. So they were looking at people whose income is just over Medicaid levels to be able to, to come in. Their, their rationale for that was in large part that the subsidies that people who are just over the Medicaid level can get, particularly under the American Rescue Plan, um, are, you know, are, so, are so high that you can have that option of getting zero premium health plans. So if you're not signed up for health insurance, it's not because you're trying to save money by not by not buying a plan because you could get a zero premium plan 
and, and that takes care of adverse selection there. That was the federal government's rationale. They, they, they're adopting that for the federal marketplace, but states that run their own health insurance marketplace, as Vermont does, has the discretion of whether they want to follow suit with this rule um, and if they want to adopt it on a different timeline or different parameters. In Vermont, uh, we think it would be better to, to go for, uh, we're, we're looking at a 200% at upper threshold rather than 150% of the fe federal poverty level. Um, so 200% equates to um, an individual earning about uh, up to about $25,000, up to about $18,000, you'd be on Medicaid. And so rather than being um, that just 18 to 20,000 or so, it gives you 18 to 25,000. Family of four, 200% of the federal poverty level is up to just over $50,000 income. And the rationale here are a few fold. One in Vermont, because we have the additional state subsidy, the, the Vermont premium assistance. That means that people at, at a slightly higher income can still get um, a zero premium plan, a, a zero pr premium enhanced silver plan with low uh, out-of-pocket costs um, up to closer to 200% of the, the federal poverty level. Whereas nationally with, with just the federal tax credit, it would be around 150%. So that adverse selection, actually we can go higher um, in Vermont, number one. Number two, currently and for the last almost two years under this public health emergency, we haven't been uh, running Medicaid redeterminations. We're not allowed to for the, for the federal, federal government. Um, we're leaving people on Medicaid, even if they would be uh, income or otherwise ineligible. But when the public health emergency ends, we'll be restarting uh, those, those redeterminations. During those times, there's typically a lot of normal times, um, which I'm not sure will be in normal times <laughs> any time this year, but as we approach, approach normal and get back to redeterminations, there is a lot of churn um, as, as people's income is not constantly at you know, Medicaid levels. You have people go on Medicaid for a few months, then they go off Medicaid when they're no longer eligible, they go on to a qualified health plan, back and forth. Um, this measure would allow people who go off Medicaid, maybe if they've moved and they don't get the, the mail or the redetermination letters, or if they don't open their mail, um, as is often the case, they find out that they don't have uh, insurance when they go to a provider for their annual checkup. Um, if they qualify for Medicaid, they can roll right back on. If they don't, in the past, they haven't been able to. This will allow people, even with um, income significantly more than that Medicaid level, to come right in and get that, uh, get that, get that health, health plan. So that's the, that's the gist um, of, the, of the proposal. Um, we, we believe it would be, um, it would be good for, for Vermonters, help uh, increase the number of Vermonters who, who have access to health insurance. We don't think it'll be an adverse selection issue for the reasons um, I said. And it also would help because these are, it would help the state's um, healthcare system draw down more, more federal dollars because uh, these are, <laughs> are the folks that, that uh, draw down the most premium, federal premium tax credits. Okay, Senator Hardy, Hardy. question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Sheehan, for your testimony. Um, just a question. It's um, at the start of your testimony, you made the distinction between an open enrollment period and a special enrollment period. And you said, essentially, DEVA was making the recommendation to um, allow, based on this new federal allowance to allow a special enrollment period for people up to 200% of poverty. It, is there a period or is it, <laughs> or is it just all year round would be a special enrollment period? Yeah, that's a great uh, question, Senator Hardy. And thank you for, for clarifying that. Senator, uh, special enrollment period is, is probably maybe not the great, greatest term for that for that reason, because the other special enrollment periods, as I mentioned, are tied to life events, generally are a 60 day, you know, finite window. This, I guess you could call this uh, an income based open enrollment, <laughs> permanent open enrollment period, but maybe be another way of, of calling it. Um, the feds, the feds are calling it a, a year round special enrollment okay. uh, period, Every but essentially. Is, yeah. 
every day is a special day. Every every day is a special day, right? Yeah, the, 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 the idea being that it's feel good. <laughs> yeah, the idea being that it's tied to 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 income, um, you know, rather than that. so if your income goes above two hundred percent, it's no longer a, a special day um, for you. But um, <laughs> right. you know, it, it, it would be you know as I, I mean, I may not have been as clear as well as this is open enrollment period is something that's specific to to private insurance and to the qualified health plans on the on the marketplace that's distinct from from Medicaid. If you're on if 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 your income is at a um, you know Medicaid eligible level, you can you can sign up at any any time of year. So this is sort of bridging that gap, um, be, you know, making a bridge between Medicaid and qualified health plans in the sense of making these uh, folks who have an income um, you know, in between Medicaid and, and higher qualified health plans, allowing them to enroll any time of year, similar to the way folks uh, who are eligible for Medicaid can. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions at this point? Okay, um, we're gonna move on to Michael Fisher. I'm sure you hate this, Michael. What could I hate about this, Senator? <laughs> um, Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for taking this time to understand this. And um, I think this is going to be a, uh, a a moment of broad agreement. I hope. Um, I think uh, everything that Diva just said is is uh, something that the healthcare advocates can office can can get broadly behind. Um, we, we think this is a good change and a change that will really help out a, a set of Vermonters. Um, and just a brief reminder that um, no surprise here, this is a particularly difficult time for families. Um, and the, uh, the coming transition, you know, currently there's no redeterminations happening uh, in Medicaid. Um, that's gonna change and, uh, and, and families are not going to be used to that. So, um, uh, so we think this flexibility will be, you know, again, for those folks who are under 200% of the federal poverty level, uh, who have precious few options, um, we think this will be a, um, a good option for them. And uh, it will certainly provide a little bit of, um, you know, good news for my advocates as they're helping, uh, helping people maneuver through this system. So, uh, a, a brief to keep with your keeping yeah. it brief to keep with your timeline. Uh, wow. We support this. Questions for Michael. Okay, we'll move on to Sarah Teachow. Good afternoon, um, Chair mm -hmm. Cummings and the rest of the committee. I'm Sarah Teachow with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont, and I'm happy to tell you that Blue Cross supports expanding the special enrollment period for low income families. We believe this will be quite meaningful to the few families that it'll apply to every year and will help with health equity um, in the state of Vermont. So we're happy to support it. I think I don't need to get into any of the arguments because Sean was quite good at explaining to you what this does. Um, and I think our experience with the COVID-19 special enrollment periods gave us a lot of comfort that this will have a pretty minimal impact on the marketplace. So okay. happy to answer questions if you have them. I'm just here in support. Wow. This is moving along. Okay, Chuck mm -hmm. Storo. Good afternoon, uh, committee. Uh, Chuck Storo, Lenine Public Affairs, here on behalf of MVP Healthcare. And you know, for all the reasons that the previous uh, witnesses have explained, uh, MVP also supports DIVA's proposal. Okay, any questions, Senator Hardy? Um, this is not a question for Chuck, although thank you, um, Chuck and Sarah. Um, it's actually, I think for Sean, maybe. Um, okay. Are you, John Sean, are you still there? Are you, you all, Adiva is proposing a rule. Is that, is that my understanding? Um, is that correct? Or, yeah, or is there something we need to do? Um, it, uh, yeah, it's a it's a piece that we can we can handle through the through the rulemaking process. I think we wanted to involve the the legislature, um, you know, for for feedback and dialogue. Obviously, there's a number of ways it it, it could go, um, but it would be consistent 
to do it through the rulemaking process in Elkari. We're, we're prepared prepared to do that. Okay, great. I think Thanks. when this started, it, if I understood you, Sean, it wasn't clear that it could go through rules. That's, um, that's correct. Yeah, I think And there were fall. a bunch of emails coming out um, saying, you know, we want to do this. So we put it on the agenda so that we all understand it. And if anyone doesn't like it, they had a chance to say they didn't like it. Okay, so when that little sheet of paper comes in from Demis, I can tell, or Charlene, um, I can tell her that we're all happy. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everyone. Um, this has been helpful committee. We are way ahead of schedule. Um, and I am not sure where to go with this, even though I thought I was leaving early trying to get out of here at five minutes of four. Um, we have a whole extra hour, which I'm sure none of you would mind having. Senator uh, Cummings? Yes. Pardon me, this is Faith. Would you like to do governor's appointees? Sure. Have we just got them to hand out? I sent them to you. You sent them to me. All right. Let me find my emails. Do you know approximately when you sent them to me? Ah. No, nope, that's next week's agenda. Hey, I'll resend it. I sent it yesterday. Yeah, oh, well, since I haven't gotten much time to work on my emails, you're probably a hundred down in here. I just sent it. You just sent it, all right. I've still got Andrew. Is my top email, but it is updating. Ah, here it is. Okay. I think Senator Brock knows all the nominees. Okay, we'll just let him do it. Okay. Um, the first one I've got is Riley Allen to the Public Utility Commission. Does Senator Bray, you want to do Riley? Sure. Okay. I knew Riley worked with him for a long time. I've known him for two. The second one is Peter Gregory of Heartland to the State Infrastructure Bank Board. Have I got anybody? Senator McSorotkin, you'll do that one. Faith, you're writing this down. And did they happen to send us contact information this year or like every year do we have to ask for it? I'm writing it down and I have the contact information for you. Okay, great. So you can get that out to us. We're making progress after 10 years. I've got Karen Hale um, of Lindenville to the Vermont Economic Development Authority. Senator Hardy, you wanna take that one? Um, Carolyn Carpenter of Salisbury of the Vermont Economic Development Authority. You'll do that? Okay. Yes, I know Carolyn. Thank you. I'll take her. Okay. Um, that's it. All right. We should be getting more. And I'm assuming we finished ours up. If I remember, we got them in just under the gun last year. Well, there so, were a couple that were late, but we got, I think we got them done during a special session. Uh, okay. Uh, we can double check on that, but it's probably best if we do them early. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, this year I am just <laughs> anticipating things being really hard and it's hard because a lot of things are not gelling yet. Um, we are going to get in to the waiting study. We're still, 
we're waiting on the governor's budget uh, address because we understand there'll be several more tax proposals in there other than the ones we got in the um, property tax. And we got a bill today to um, make federal civil servants pensions tax free. I don't know about anybody else, but I would expect that the state employees might be a little upset if we did that for the feds and not for them. Um, and right now, I'm not sure I want to touch anything that has to do with state or <laughs> employees, <laughs> public employees and retirement. Um, it, we have a, a, a touchy balance right now. Senator Bray. Yeah, you know, I mean, this is an ongoing challenge, right? We have military pensions, so then federal pensions, then it could be state employee pensions. And, and the, the irony is that um, I get it. We may not score well on some sort of sheet compared to some other states that provide for exemptions. But I think the reality is that for most of our constituents, they're not, they are less well off than the people receiving yes. these payments. So every time we uh, do this or consider doing this, it's to the detriment, I think, of sort of the average Vermonter who's going to be asked to pick up the slack. And, and now maybe we're, you know, some people make the kind of like the uh, remote recruitment of workers. Maybe someone will tell me it's cash flow positive to give these exemptions, but um, I don't know. There's no work retirement, and I don't know that federal civil servants retire early and work afterwards. Senator Brock. Well, I, I would repeat what I, I've said, I think, in, in prior years while this has been on the table. I think that military retirement is different. I think that there is a, uh, uh, in the public, uh, a belief that this is a, a wise thing to do. We're one of only three states that does not do that. And we are losing labor. And if, if we look at this as an economic development tool, and I hope to be able when, uh, I hope this comes off the wall to at least have a brief discussion about it, to be able to prov provide some facts and figures that show that this is in fact a revenue positive thing uh, in a state where we have this severe shortage of workers. Okay. I think we did establish with the tax commissioner, however, that most of these exemptions went in in the early 50s when we were all feeling very patriotic for our returning soldiers. However, the bill didn't come due for another 20 years. Um, Vermont did a deduction on your home value, a $2,000 deduction, which was significant when homes were selling for 20, 15 13, $10,000 a year in that time frame, And that exemption went, it didn't go away. It's just, you usually do better um, under Act 60 paying on your income rather than taking that deduction. But it isn't like Vermont did nothing. We put our money where our mouth was early on. And um, we did do something. So I'm not going to feel guilty. Uh, and we can move forward. I just have a hard time. We have police officers that have to retire at 55. And we're not, ex and I think most firefighters retire early. And we are not doing anything for their pensions. And they do serve us. So, Senator Hardy, how, how do we get here? <laughs> I moved around. I don't know, everybody. No, I, I'm just following on our course of discussion. Because oh, you mentioned a bill and then it mentioned That's other right. bills. But I, I just wanted to weigh in and say I agree with you and that Senator Brock, I believe we asked the tax commissioner for data last year and he didn't have any um, that supported the notion that it was that it was both a, a 
draw for retire, military retirees or an economic benefit for the state. There, he had no data. So maybe things well, have changed. That was the point. Him. It had no data. And that's what I hope to be able to present to you is data. Okay. okay. Well, if you have it, that, I would be interested in seeing it. We Can will have remember? the tax commissioner in once all the governor's proposals are out. Um, and we will... And there's a few more floating around. So we're going to take a look at all of them um, before. Plus, I'm trying to tie down what I find, what our revenue, what our traditional, they call it the alligator jaw, but the traditional track between our base revenues and our base expenses. And they're waiting. They want to see uh, the new uh, Tom Kovett's new forecast, and they want to see um, all the governor's tax proposals. But as we are going to start with the income property, yeah, property tax based on income, um, school uh, and income based school funding. Um, but I, I'm trying to get all that information out there. So we have it to sort through and it's just getting it all together at this point. And we obviously have a lot of new people um, at joint fiscal. So uh, that's part of what we're struggling with, with the agenda. So I'm gonna try and get as many of the newer bills on and out. I'd like to get Rygate either out or decide we're not putting it out as soon as possible um, so we can move forward. So Senator Hardy. Yeah, I just wanted to say tomorrow, I'm gonna be briefly talking to you all about the pupil waiting stuff and right. what, what your thoughts are and um, what information you need. So if you can be thinking about that, about what you're going to want to hear, We're, we are specifically talking about the weights or cost equity payments, that part of the program, the poverty measure, and this, um, the evaluation mechanism. Um, the ELL grants is starting in the education committee, and then would probably come over to us when they're done with it, just so you know that. But if you can think about it, we're gonna have Brad James in, I think on Friday. So I'd like to be able to prep him um, with what you all need. Um, Senator Brock and I spent six months on this. And so I'm sure we'd both rather hey, not Brock go looks over enthused. every single thing <laughs> again, but we wanna make sure that you have the information you need to understand the proposal in a way yeah. forward. Yeah, so, this one is, is momentous. I mean, this is a, a once we haven't looked at weights and I don't know, not in my time in the Senate. So yeah. that means it's been a lifetime. They pre-speed um, Act 60. They've been in since yeah, oh, the yeah. formula. So, uh, so uh, they may even precede Senator McDonald. Um, so we will be getting all the information we can on that one. And then kind of, is a discussion out of that is, is the property tax. So we'll be looking at that. Um, the other thing I'm sure they're still trying to calculate is the impact on the, now that we seem to have an agreement on pensions, um, finding out what that impact is on um, the ed fund. So, we may have less of a surplus than we thought we had. And then depending on what we do on waiting, that could have an impact on the ed fund. Um, and so we're gonna need to get all of that out there um, because at some point we're gonna set a yield or a tax rate. I still can't understand the yield. We're gonna set a tax rate. Um, at some point this year, Senator Pearson. Madam Chair, when do we get the updated forecast? Uh, Tom Cavett is coming in this week or next week, Faith? I think it's Friday. 
it's Friday. And there's an e-board meeting in the morning. We'll set the revenue figures for the budget. And then Tom Cavett is coming in. And weeks ago, I got an announcement that maybe it's just legislative, maybe it's committee chairs can meet with him at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, but we will have him in after the e-board to walk us through all his economic projections and where he thinks things will be going. Um, he usually doesn't do a formal five-year forecast, but definitely as part of this, he's looking at what's likely to happen. And I think right now where we seem to be swimming in federal money, uh, the question is, what is going to happen? You know, where are we when the federal money goes away? Um, given the Build Back Better bill's progress um, in Congress, I'm not going to start spending any major federal largesse except maybe on roads and bridges, which will make transportation very happy. But I, I think we've probably gotten the big slug. Um, hopefully the economy will get a slug from infrastructure, but um, we will find that out. 